afternoon, everyone. I'm Jenny Blizzard, a communications advisor with Fed Communities. Welcome to the Connecting Communities webinar, Integrating Economic Inclusion to Strengthen Local Economies. Today, you'll hear more about how communities have organized and worked collaboratively to remove barriers to inclusive regional growth through their participation in the Reinventing Our Communities cohort program, which will be revert, referred to as ROC today. We're excited to kick off our second Connecting Communities webinar this year. But before we get started, we would like to share a few house, housekeeping items. Today's session is being recorded. The recording will be available within the next two weeks. Views expressed during this session are those of the speakers and are intended for informational purposes. They do not necessarily represent the views of Fed communities or the Federal Reserve System. Microphones have been muted. Please use the Q&A feature throughout the session to submit questions. We promise to get to as many of them as possible during the Q&A portion of this presentation. And finally, please feel free to keep the conversation going and engage with us on Twitter using the hashtag Connecting Communities. Before moving to the content of today's event, I would like to briefly introduce today's moderator. Nilu Ponth is a Community Development Advisor at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Before joining the Fed, she worked as the Development Director and Entrepreneurship Lead at a nonprofit where she was instrumental in creating a small business development program along with a microloan fund that helped start several Black-owned small businesses. One of Nilu's roles at the St. Louis Fed is to convene stakeholders to help strengthen economic mobility around St. Louis. The St. Louis Fed has engaged with the Boone County, Missouri Rock cohort participant. You'll hear more about Boone County's work later in the presentation. So now without further ado, I turn it over to Nilu. Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry about that delay. It's the little things uh, called technology. But again, welcome. Um, and uh, Jenny, thank you for that introduction. Um, I also would like to thank our ROC team at the Philadelphia FET for allowing me to moderate this very, very timely topic around racial equity and economic mobility. Today, we will share stories from within our communities of practice on, times, uh, on types of commitment and solutions that are required for elevating economic mobility through a racial and equity lens in our uh, historically marginalized communities. So with that, why are we, why is the Fed focusing on racial equity? So Dan, could you take me? Thank you. And so we are doing it for three purposes, to promote a healthy economy, um, to examine and understand events, risks, and trends that affect the economy and to walk the talk. With that next slide, please, Dan. So Reinventing Our Communities is sponsored by the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia and uh, supports uh, local level capacity building on racial equity. And so what is uh, racial equity? Um, so what is racial equity? So how do we define racial equity? So in order to reinvent our communities um, through structural change, the CD function of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia uh, conceptualized, how do we support local level capacity building on racial equity? So structural change requ requires local level capacity to think, plan, and engage on racial equity leading to community-led solutions for local challenges. So again, so what is, how do we define racial equity? It is just and fair inclusion in an economy in which all can participate, prosper and reach their full potential. And race can no longer predict life outcomes um, for, our, um, for our communities. 
So why do we focus? So why focus on race? Racial in, uh, inequities are deep and pervasive across local policy areas. So intentional structural and race explicit strategies are needed to achieve meaningful and sustainable advances in racial equity, economic inclusion and expanded employment, housing and wealth creation. So this is our approach to system change. So merging racial equity training with training on a community identified topical challenge enables our cohorts who have participated in our programs for the last two to three years to translate their theor the, theor the theoretical to the practical and build capacity of their local uh, communities and, and ecosystems to apply a racial equity framework to specific issue areas. Next slide, Jen. So what is uh, the ROC program? What are the pillars of this um, community focused uh, program design um, that we are discussing today? And so capacity, so we have, it's a four pronged approach. So one is capacity building, meaning capacity building of local ecosystems in our communities to be able to implement strategies uh, through a racial equity lens, whether it's for affordable, whether it's around affordable housing, workforce, small business development. So that's uh, one of the uh, main priorities of this program design. And it is community led. So we reach out to communities who, who are already doing this work, who are the experts in these areas and who have the pulse of the community. So it has to be community led. And then creative leveraging. So this uh, is, is, is the third uh, leg of the tool for, uh, of this tool for this program, which is the program leveraged, um, this, this was actually, this program, uh, the, this new design or this theory of change actually happened um, as a result of um, our, our uh, reinventing our communities um, theme. Uh, and, and, and so, but we realized that we needed to have a more topical approach rather than uh, working with broad topics and had to have a racial lens uh, to this um, initiative. And the fourth is, this, uh, is sustainable systems change. So each cohort develops as they come into this program, they, they are here for a, for a year and each cohort develops a multi-year racial equity plan for their communities. And that's my sensor of my light. So, <laughs> um, so with that, another slide then. So the program structure, I kind of um, mentioned this a little bit earlier, but it's uh, we have, we provide racial equity training that happens towards the first part of the, um, of that one year journey. And then it's the economic development training. So each year we have a topical area that we hone in on. This year is workforce development. Last year was small business development. And so each of the, the, um, the cohort uh, working uh, uh, groups train with leading research and practitioners around those topical areas. Like as, again, for this year, it was workforce development and coaching and advising. They receive the cohort members receive individualized coaching and advising for their groups. Uh, we also have liaisons for each of uh, each of these uh, cohorts who work again one on one with them or in in the group, and then. At the end of the program, uh, the cohorts uh, create an equity plan from all of the interactions and the trainings that they have received through this initiative or through the ROC program. Next um, slide, Dan. All right, so with that, we have three very prominent leaders uh, of our cohort teams that have participated in the past and uh, who are now participating. So with that, um, our first speaker, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Nick Steele. Nick uh, is the executive director of Access Community Capital Inc. 
a community loan fund providing affordable capital to small businesses located in Nevada. Access Community is uh, cap Access Community Capital is a minority-led, mission-driven organization directed by entrepreneurs who understand the plight of business ownership. As an entrepreneur, Mr. Steele knows firsthand lack of access to affordable capital. What lack of access uh, to affordable ca uh, capital can adversely affect the trajectory of a business, stifling its growth potential. While also investing in other entrepreneurs, Mr. Steele is focused on changing the landscape of opportunity for underserved uh, populations by operating uh, access community capital as a community development financial institution or CDFI compelled to address the inequities present in the, in the lending landscape. Nick is most excited about his current role as both a lender and business advisor to entrepreneurs developing their own ideas into successful companies. We will hear from Nick a little later as to uh, some of his innovative solutions to um, creating a more robust ecosystem of lending for our small businesses. Our second, is, our second speaker is Lori Girardi. Lori is a current cohort working in, within that workforce uh, ecosystem. And Lori is a vice president and chief strategy officer at the United Way of Delaware. She has um, been an executive leader, a seasoned business consultant, a former educator, professional speaker, and technology enthusiast. For the past decade and a half, Lori has served as an executive leader and business consultant, consultant leading startup ventures, turnarounds, and full-scale cultural shifts through integrated, cohesive, high-impact initiatives. She has served as acting chief operating officer, chief field development officer, and vice president of sales for corporate clients embracing change. Today, she serves the community as vice president and Chief Strategy Officer at United Way of Delaware, which is able to meld her passion for education, commitment to excellence, and desire to make Delaware a leader in racial equity um, and social justice into an exciting career working with colleagues and partners across the state who are making a real difference in the lives of others. Our third speaker is um, from um, Boone County, uh, uh, that's a region that we cover here in the 8th District at the St. Louis Fed. And it has been a pleasure working with Joanne and, uh, others, um, and other stakeholders from Boone County. So Joanne Nelson is the director of the Boone County Community Services Department. She has been with the department since April 20, 2014, first as a program manager and then as the director. Joanne has extensive experience working with nonprofit organizations over the past 25 plus years. She understands the many nuances involved in grants. She has written grant applications, delivered grant services, developed grant proposals, re reviewed grant reports, and managed grant contracts. In her free time, Joanne enjoys traveling with her husband, Doug, and their family and pretending that she has a green thumb. So with that, it is a pleasure to welcome all of our speakers who are committed to making our communities more equitable and, um, and create ecosystems for economic mobility within our historically marginalized communities. So with further ado, Nick, the floor is yours. We are very excited to learn from you today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nilu. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as Nilu mentioned, uh, my name is Nick Steele. I'm the Executive Director of Access Community Capital. Uh, we are a, a CDFI information in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, we were formed two years ago, uh, just in time for the ROC uh, uh, cohort uh, to launch in Las Vegas. And I'm super excited to be here and kind of share some best practices um, with that said, I'm going to jump in, just jump into the presentation. I look forward to any questions, uh, questions at the end. Next slide, please. 
Uh, just to kind of give you some background information, uh, the Las Vegas cohort started uh, our year long journey uh, with the Federal Reserve Bank um, in uh, June of 2021. We met every two weeks. Uh, the cohort learned about the history of race in America and how institutionalized policies uh, disenfranchised large uh, segments of the population. Uh, this learning um, inspired ongoing collaborations among cohort members, encouraged uh, the sharing of best practices uh, from other cohorts across the country, and helped set the foundation for Las Vegas and our cohort to organize around uh, a sim our simple principle, which is uh, uh, providing equitable uh, small business recovery and uh, capital, uh, supporting the diverse and minority business owners in, in Nevada. Next slide, please. I think Nilu uh, mentioned uh, something that I, I took note of, and uh, she said uh, one of our missions uh, as the cohort uh, was to uh, translate the theoretical to the practical. And uh, I really want to highlight that because for our cohort and uh, other successful cohorts around the country, uh, what we noticed is that uh, you start off high level with where you want to impact and what differences you want to make in your in your community but you really have to quickly drill down on what tangible things that you want to accomplish. And so for us as a cohort, we wanted to identify uh, um, the key organizations that were gonna be part of our, our cohort, but also the key organizations that we wanted to impact in our ecosystem. Uh, as part of our cohort, uh, the our organizations uh, uh, that participated were the City of Las Vegas, uh, Nevada Partners, which is a community organization, um, the Urban Chamber of Commerce, uh, Promise Startups, which uh, uh, runs and administers entrepreneurial uh, uh, entrepreneurial uh, programming, and Access Community Capital, uh, which uh, primarily provides uh, access to affordable capital uh, to underserved communities. Uh, we in identifying our stakeholders that we wanted to impact. Uh, those included uh, other existing BIPOC organizations, the Small Business Development Center. Uh, other business development support organizations, as well as uh, state and municipal economic development offices. Um, it, to be a little bit more specific about some of those uh, business development organizations, we really wanted to uh, quickly identify. So we made a list of over 40 uh, organizations across the state that were providing business development services. And uh, we wanted to uh, prioritize which organizations we wanted, uh, we were reaching out to throughout our year-long process and which programming uh, we wanted those organizations to participate in. Next slide. Our two goals uh, for our cohort were to make capital more accessible for underserved communities and to shift the business ecosystem to be more supportive of BIPOC entrepreneurs and business owners. Now, that were, those were our, our high-level goals. The way to accomplish those, uh, we set a, set a, put, put forth together three initiatives. One was to influence the operating environment in which businesses participate in. The second was to increase access to financial capital. And the third was to fast track high growth opportunities for um, early and emerging stage businesses. Next slide. I'm going to briefly talk about uh, three of those. Uh, actually, uh, I'm gonna, going to highlight three uh, initiatives uh, that we that we worked on, um, even though I think that was it, it turned the, the ones that I'm highlighting. Uh, are three out of about 12 in total uh, that we identified and have been working on uh, since uh, June of 2021. In the operating plan, um, the uh, we analyzed the, ge the geographic and uh, industry focus areas for the small business development centers and other business service organizations and uh, quickly uh, determined which uh, organizations were underserving the, the community. Uh, we wanted to analyze the ecosystem, and so we did that uh, um, on a zip code by zip code basis, comparing the populations, the demographics, uh, income levels, and uh, and try to parse out which organizations were targeting certain areas and uh, where there were deserts in pro in providing uh, some of those business support or organizations. That kind of set the foundation for us because uh, really taking a data a centric approach allowed us to identify which organizations um, uh, were operating, where they were operating, and what their core uh, uh, capabilities were. And that way we could address, address uh, uh, some of the uh, deficiencies that we found in the existing marketplace. And so in doing so, we created a data set 
uh, with uh, a current state snapshot of small business uh, organizations operating in cities and municipalities, uh, organize them by industry, including uh, data like um, uh, their business size, location, ownership, um, the uh, the race of the of the owner, and then um, uh, pulled in some of our key stakeholders, which were the Small Business Development Center and some of the uh, city and state economic development departments. Um, we leaned on the ROC cohorts from other parts of the uh, of other parts of the country to identify. Uh, some of some of their best practices. So we noticed in Chicago there was a small business ecosystem assessment. Uh, Next Street had a uh, a platform, and uh, some uh, there were some other platforms out there that we uh, we sought to bring into Nevada to help us with this uh, this assessment. Next slide, please. In looking at how to address uh, uh, the inequities in accessing affordable capital. Uh, we wanted to improve the way that commercial banks uh, work with CDFIs uh, to ensure that uh, BIPOC business owners uh, uh, were able to access the funding that they needed to not only survive, but to thrive as, come, as we were coming out of the pandemic. And one of our plans was to build this uh, robust uh, loan referral system. Um, we wanted at least five financial institutions so uh, to uh, uh, to participate in which uh, if they received the uh, received uh, and a new application or originated a new application and that applicant applicant didn't quite meet the credit profile that they were looking for uh, we would create this robust uh, referral system so that a, de a decline uh, didn't just send the person right back out the door a decline would actually send them over to a cdfi or another organ uh, community lender uh, that could uh, better uh, assess uh, that uh, or that that business owners needs and maybe be able to provide some some additional capital um, in doing so, we partnered uh, directly with some institutions, financial institutions, but also partnered with uh, the Nevada Bankers Association, and this allowed us uh, to uh, uh, really uh, expand our, our own personal network, but also expand the network of institutions that were looking to make a difference uh, in, in the ecosystem. I'm glad to say that uh, in January of this year, through the SSBCI program, uh, the state of Nevada rolled out a uh, statewide platform for uh, for uh, business applicants um, in which they apply. It's an embedded uh, finance platform in which uh, business uh, business owners can apply, and uh, they are matched with financial institutions that are participating. And so, I think that uh, has gone a long way to uh, uh, to uh, helping us um, address the, some of the access to capital needs within the state. Next slide, please. And the third uh, uh, plan that I'll, I'll talk about is one of our what we call high growth plans. And this was uh, our goal was to create and promote uh, business coaching and training uh, for BIPOC uh, business uh, business owners, but to do so in a, in a manner that uh, really was a different than what uh, we saw out there in the eco ecosystem. Um, when we read surveys and white papers, business owners were really craving for, and still to this day are craving for that one-on-one -on -one guidance, uh, that uh, business navigator uh, sort of approach, as opposed to uh, um, uh, accessing the a business support ecosystem and really just ha just having access to webinars and general uh, generalized information and so uh, one of our plans was to uh, set out and offer specific guidance to uh, organizations providing business uh, support and uh, business support services um, and and share our our knowledge of what business owners wanted uh, want and 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 continue to uh, to, to need uh, we have uh, partnered with uh, CDFIs, uh, with the SBDC, with other organizations across the state, and uh, over the last year, a number of programs have uh, have cropped up and launched, uh, providing this business navigator approach. Um, sometimes taking advantage of the uh, of the SBA business navigator program, and other times being financed. Uh, from uh, city economic development offices or from uh, phil philanthropic organizations. And so that one-on-one -on -one business approach has been uh, instrumental and uh, very critical to the uh, success of uh, business owners over the past year. And uh, a lot of those programs are expanding into uh, 2023. Next slide. 
that's the end of my set of presentation. Um, I'm glad to uh, uh, to answer questions uh, at the at the end. Uh, but for our next uh, uh, speaker, uh, I wanted to introduce Lori Girardi, uh, the Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer of United Way of Delaware. Thank you so much. So super excited to be here. Um, if you would, next slide. Um, today, I'm going to share a little bit about our experience. Um, we're, we're being called Southern Delaware, but if you've ever been to Delaware, um, it, we're a very small state from north to south, it's two hours. And um, we focused for our cohort on Kent and Sussex counties. So there are two southern counties in the state. Um, and we were um, invited to apply um, for this program. And I just want to give a, a little um, um, commercial break to say, if you're thinking about applying or watching this to see what it's like, I would highly encourage it. Often we don't take time for professional development for ourselves, especially in areas where we might have expertise or our organizations are known for doing certain kind of work. Um, and I have to say this was one of the best experiences of my professional life, being able to learn from others who are forging the path and doing um, similar things or very different things um, and having that safe space to talk through um, racial equity questions and solutions and, and roadblocks um, and learn from, from the experts. Next slide, please. So our cohort comprised of the United Way of Delaware, um, and that is where I am the chief strategy officer. We are a United Way that spans the whole state, so from north to south in Delaware. And our cohort included um, one of our colleagues from our Stand By Me Next Gen team. Um, they um, provide financial literacy um, in classroom experiences for students and also um, have a really robust program um, to make sure that kids and their families know how to pay for college and, and fill out FAFSA and um, really help make sure that the, the funds that kids need to get on that path, um, that they're there for them. And um, they do it in a very consultative way. So I'm very proud of, of, of that team. And then we looked at across the state, who else could we include? So we um, reached out to our workforce development board and um, our Kent and Sussex, um, uh, Greater Kent Committee, Kent and Sussex Alliance. Um, and then we looked at some grassroots um, organizations, Law Esperanza and First State Community Action Agency. And then we wanted to make sure we included our Department of Education and um, also another statewide organization, Rodell, that focuses on education in Delaware and has been a partner in forging um, Delaware to have wonderful pathway options for students. So in the cohort experience, um, it, it to me, it came very fast where it was like, now formulate your project. And so um, we were a little bit nervous at the start because we're like, we're just getting to know each other really well and learning. And wow, now we have to come up with a plan. Um, but things always work out the way they're supposed to. And um, several of us were having lots of conversations offline. And we decided to coalesce around um, our high school seniors. So our program that we are developing, and we're developing it like building the airplane while it's flying, um, is called Success for Our Seniors. And we embrace the idea that we could plan a program and spend all the time you know, making it perfect and raising the money for it and doing all the things and buttoning it up perfectly. But we needed to move with a sense of urgency because today's seniors are tomorrow's workforce. Next slide, please. And so our mission was very simple to look at today's graduating class, so the class of 2023, and say, how could we help this class this year? We looked at the data, and we have a, a somewhere between 8,500 and 10,000 um, high school seniors graduate every year in Delaware. A little more than half go on to at least uh, apply and start college. And then a little less than half either enter the workforce or might not have a path at all. And then a startling figure for us, I mean, it's, it's one thing when you know the data, like you you can see it on a piece of paper, but when you start to think these are students that we could have helped while they're still in school, 13.1% um, of our, our youth ages 16 to 24 in Delaware are disconnected or opportunity youth. And we wanted to do something to make a change. And so we band together and said, what if we didn't make it perfect? What if we started and worked to build it as we went? Next slide, please. And so the first thing we wanted to do was to really encourage um, everyone across the state 
to celebrate our seniors for whichever path they choose. We know that college signing day is a big thing. And, and we always see the, you know, the, the sweatshirts and whatever um, of the, the swag of where kids are, are going to college. But we don't often have that same fanfare for our high school seniors who are choosing the workforce or an apprenticeship or training program, or maybe entering a two-year college program um, or a certification program, or they've decided to start a business, how exciting for them or students are, who are going into the military or some form of service. And so first and foremost, we wanted to celebrate students for the path that they're on. And if they don't have a path, how can we help them identify one before they graduate so we can help put the resources in place for them? Next slide, please. So our vision was pretty simple, but really clear. First, we wanted to make sure they had a clear path. And so we partnered with um, one of our high schools here in Delaware. And from the first meeting to a survey being deployed for the whole senior class was about three weeks. And that never happens in the world. You know, and we didn't overthink it. So was the survey perfect? No, but we deployed it and we learned a lot about the kids. And I'll share some of those um, results in a minute. But what we wanted to know from them is what are your plans today? What are you thinking is your path? And then we wanted to build out the plan for how we would celebrate them and then figure out what are the missing pieces. So students know what they need very often. They're very intuitive. They listen to everything around them. So we asked a very simple question. If you're on the path going to college, a four-year college, what do you need help with? Have you filled out your FAFSA? Have you applied? And they were really honest in their answers. One of the pieces of feedback we've gotten from the school is that just the simple help of us deploying the survey or creating the survey, I should say, and then analyzing it and delivering back to the school counselors, their students' answers was something that they don't have the capacity to do. So as we started to partner with the school district um, in particular, we um, wanted the teachers and the educators and the school counselors to embrace the idea that we were not trying to come in and do something to them. We wanted to bring like a whole army of help with us and I have to say, um, the reception was amazing. And we all have been kind of rowing in the same direction since we started this work together. And then we want to make sure we connect the dots no matter which path they're on. And then our ultimate goal is to stay connected with, this, with these students after they graduate so that in that, you know, the summer slide, if they start to panic about things, they know who to call. As United Way of Delaware, we also um, operate Delaware 211, our state's helpline. So we're trying to figure out creative ways that we can keep them connected um, through technology, but also that they know they have someone to call if they need help. Next slide. So we, we decided to get going and start now and then scale as we went. And I'm going to tell you about the two separate paths. Next slide. So as I said, we partnered with one of our school districts, Capital School District in the um, center of our state. And um, we partnered with them for several reasons. One of the reasons being that Dover, where um, the Capital School District is located, has very high unemployment comparatively. And one of our key partners is the Workforce Development Board. Um, and so we wanted to not only provide supports while the kids were still in school, but that they were connected to the statewide supports that they're eligible for as soon as they graduate. And that's often where that gap happens where they don't know what to ask. And then now they're out of school, there's no way to get in touch with them. So that's one of the things that we're trying to do. And then as United Way, we work with community partners all across the state and we reached out to them and brought them together and said, hey, we're embarking on this initiative. Would you like to participate with us? And overwhelmingly, we've had a great response from all of our partners. And again, what we started with was deploying a survey to the community partners for them to deploy to their seniors. Next slide. And so we started with about 600 students, um, seniors within our community partners and approximately 400 um, in Dover High. And to date, we've collected somewhere around 300, 350 um, surveys. So we didn't get surveys from all the students, but it's a really good start. And the learnings that we're, we're getting from them are gonna be invaluable, but we're also kind of um, filtering their answers through a funnel so that we make sure we're connecting the kids and their families with the solutions that they might need. All right, next slide. 
So our solution was relatively simple and it's gonna be built over the next year. Survey the kids, what path are you on? Map the resources to give them the tools that they need. Include the student voice. So as we move into next year, we'll be having a student led committee who helps advise us as, um, as a vital part of um, them feeling like there are partners in their future, that we're not doing something to them. Um, the equity lens was really important. We're intentionally asking ourselves, what could we do different? Um, what could we do to make sure that it's not just the kids who fill out a survey who were able to help, but what about the ones who didn't come to school that day? How do we make sure that they're heard and that we put resources in, in place for them? And then meeting students where they are. So just a for instance, and then I will wrap up my section. Um, on Monday, we're meeting with a group of 40 students. Um, we have about 15 adults who are going to our, our high school partner, and we're going to meet one-on-one -on -one with 40-ish kids who said they want to enter the workforce or enter a training program. And we're going to just have a conversation with them, a guided conversation, so we can find out more about what they want and what they're hoping for and maybe where they're stuck. And then we're going to work with the businesses in their community to find businesses that might have jobs for them. But we're doing it in a real consultative way so that the students feel supported and the businesses are getting what they need. And we're figuring out what those things are as we go. And there's certainly some models that we can follow for that. Next slide, please. Um, so just very, very briefly, our survey results might have been how you might have expected. We had about 50% of the kids said they were on a college pass path. And then about 10% were in each of the other paths. But when talking to our school counselors, they said, you know, we're really good at that college path. But if 50% of our kids are not going to college, we really do want your help. And so we are um, working to bring more and more organizations and businesses into our initiative. And in fact, just this morning, um, we had a pancakes in progress and we had over 100 um, educators, business people, entrepreneurs, um, you know, government officials in the room saying we want to be a part of this too. So feel like we've gotten off to a, a good start, even though we had a little sense of panic when it was like, what's your project? It's coming to into fruition to really be something that is going to hopefully connect all the dots um, so that our students graduate high school with a clear path. And if they hit bumps along the way, they know exactly who to call and who to turn to for that help. Um, next slide. And I think it's probably my wrap. Yep. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over now to Joanne Nelson, who is from Boone County, um, and she's going to talk to you about her experience. Let's start this over again. Hello, everyone. My name is Joanne Nelson, and I am the director of the Boone County Community Services Department. Our department oversees the Children's Services Fund tax, which is a quarter cent sales tax that allows us to purchase services from nonprofits and governmental entities to, to help strengthen excuse me, to help strengthen families and provide services to children and youth. Our department currently has a budget of $13.5 million budgeted for 2023. For anybody who doesn't know, Missouri, um, we are located, Boone County is located centrally between St. Louis and Kansas City, Missouri. We have a population of about 183,000 individuals. The county seat is Columbia, and we also where we house two colleges and the University of Missouri. The population estimate in 2020 for Columbia is 126,000 people, which is about 68% of Boone County's population. The rest is considered rural. Next slide, please. Now I want to give you a background on our the work that we've been doing. Um, it kind of started back in 2020, and it, there's some background to this. And as we move forward, you'll kind of I'll tie it into the work we've been doing with the Rock. Um, back in 2020, um, one of the county commissioners contacted our department about fun a funding opportunity through the Urban Institute, which had received funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to help create mobility action plans. Our department 
had worked with several community initi initiatives and she felt this, that this would be really a good, great opportunity for us to pursue. In early 2021, we found out that we were one of eight counties cho chosen nationwide to participate in the inaugural co upward mobility cohort. Other communities in the cohort included Alameda, California, which encompasses the Fremont San Francisco Bay Area, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Ramsey County, Minnesota, which is in the St. Paul, Minnesota area, Riverside, California, which encompasses Riverside and areas near Los Angeles, St. Louis, St. Louis, St. Lucie County, Florida, which is Port St. Lucia, Summit County, Ohio, which is Ohio, which is the Akron area, and Washington, D.C. The Urban Institute provided awardees with funding, technical assistance, and peer learning opportunities to help communities develop a mobility action plan aimed at improving upward mobility and reducing inequities. The county's engagement with the upper in, Urban Institute Upward Mobility Cohort came at a critical time. Across many metrics of well being, Boone County appears to be really a county that uh, where everyone excels. However, the data disaggregated by race, ethnicity showed a very different story. White, white families with, with resources fare well with the county, they have lower poverty rates higher scores of measures of achievement in schools and better health outcomes. Families of color, specifically black families, disproportionately experience higher poverty rates, poor school outcomes. Excuse me, I lost my track. Um, poor school outcomes, more juvenile referrals to ju juvenile justice and, and the disparities were just overwhelmingly um, not good. Basically, it meant if you were a person of color in our county, you were at severe disadvantage, severe disadvantage for upward mobility. Those in poverty within the county are impacted by limited upward mobility across generations. Boone County sought to create a holistic approach to improving education, health, housing, and safety, and workforce to foster a generational economic success for those who are in need in Boone County. Central to the development of our mobility action plan was engaging community members with lived experience to identify results, indicators, root causes, and strategic actions. Beginning in the spring of 2021, Boone County began the planning process. We knew that we wanted to approach this process critically with a level of commitment to the voices of those in our community who had been historically left out. Traditional planning efforts in Boone County have solicited feedback from communities through interviews, town halls, and other venues to earn buy-in and to add their stories to build consensus. But we wanted to approach this a little differently. The intentional, this intentionality led to us using the results-based accountability in planning and creating the upward mobility action plan. The RBA framework simply connects local trends and other data related to community health issues toward working towards a common population result. The community engagement really began in, in August of 2021 with a data walk attended by public and private members of the community. A gallery of data posters displayed mobility metrics data and locally available data from various sources. Participants in the data walked grouped were grouped and then they walked around the group and then they came back and they what we asked them was, what do you want to change in the next five years? This led to discussion and a consensus was built on which metrics they would really wanted to prioritize for this project. So the, there were several priorities identified and they finally decided that they were going to focus on three areas. The first was improving disparities of literacy scores by third grade, which led to the formation of the early early grade literacy group. 
The second priority was reduce opportunity gaps in workforce development and employment, which led to the formation of the Jobs and Workforce Development Workgroup. And the third was to increase available inclusive housing to reduce and mitigate neighborhood segregation that and which led to the fair and inclusive housing work group. As a result of the pri uh, priorities identified, stakeholder facilitators began planning the process with three work groups mentioned. The three work groups were then tasked with talking through the walking through the results-based accountability turn the curve model. Uh, the initial planning from them af after the data walk started in November 2021 and went on for several months, requiring each of the three work groups to meet and develop a mobility action plan, which can, included a results statement, coming up with a list of in indicators to assess progress towards the result, find out the root causes use it for trends in data, and finally determining feasible strategic action for work group members to pursue. Work group meetings consisted of those with lived experience, community leaders, community stakeholders, which included nonprofit, city government, and elected officials, as all is equal planning partners. The result, this resulted in a transparent and inclusive intentional planning process built by and for the residents of Boone County. The improving upward mobility from mobility, um, mobility action plan was released in 2022. The picture on your slide depicts the cover of our cliff note version. The full report was a little over 167 pages long. One of the community organizations that partnered with uh, our department was the was Central Missouri Community Action or CMCA. Partnering with CMCA made sense. Central Community Action's mission is to build relationships to empower people, strengthen and resilient strengthen in resilience and improve quality of life for all members of the community. Not only did CMCA play an integral role as stakeholder groups, but they also provided our department with, ex with ex expertise and assistance in the application of the results-based accountability through the entire project. While the community worked collaborati collaboratively on developing the mobility action plan, CMCA was awarded the opportunity to participate in the 2022 Reinventing Our Communities cohort program focused on equitable workforce recovery. The opportunity, the opportunity like the Urban Institute, Urban Institute Upward Mobility Project, offered CMCA the opportunity to engage in racial equity and workforce trainings, peer learning, and personalized coaching and advice to lead to the development of the local work, workforce equity plans. The role of the ROC cohort was to apply the racial equity solutions to strengthen regional ec economies and foster better economic outcomes. The goals of the ROC cohort and the strategic actions of the Job and Workforce Development Work Group of the Upward Mobility Cohort were aligned in many ways. It made sense to join forces. The Boone County Rock Cohort has helped us to keep the plan from sitting on the shelf and allowed us to carry on with the project. They are assisting with a lot of work on the, on the next slide. In this slide, you see an example of a worksheet that we use for the Jobs and Workforce Development Strategic, strategic Action Group, Implementing Upwardly Mobile Business Practice. A similar, a similar form was used in all the groups. The form includes um, the name of the group, um, the result statement, which is Boone County is a flourishing community where everyone can live, learn, and grow. The name of the strategy, what's the story behind the curve, what's the root causes, and who are the partners that play a role in the curve. And then also it, it describes the steps to implement the mobility uh, business practice sub-strategies. Next slide, please. 
So um, we work through all these uh, different groups. So we had the jobs and workforce, and then they were divided into three separate areas. And another area was to enhance support for justice involved individuals. Um, every group, uh, whether it's jobs and workforce, whether it was uh, fair and inclusive housing, or if it was the um, early grade literacy, work through the RBA process using that story behind the curve, um, what the root causes were, and uh, who were the partners to play. Um, currently, we're working on convening these work groups to implement the sub-strategies identified through the mobility action. Um, uh, thank you, and if you have any other questions, let me know. Hey, Neelu, you just need to unmute yourself. Thank you, Joanne, Lori, and Nick for sharing your uh, rock cohort stories and the work that, that you are doing outside of rock. Um, very, very inspiring. Um, the themes that I heard again were uh, assessments of uh, your ecosystems, um, access to capital, access to opportunities, and then collaboration building. So with that, I would like to pose a question to the panelists before we open it up to the entire group uh, for your question. We don't have a whole lot of time, but we should be able to get through one or two uh, questions that have come up um, for the panelists. So this, this is for all, uh, for Nick, Lori, and for Joanne. How has peer learning going through the ROC program with communities from across the country, like how you represent um, shaped your own uh, community cohorts racial equity work. Well, I'll I'll answer. Um, I would say the the word for me is intentionality. That um, because we all often move really fast, getting the work of any given day or week or month done. Um, stopping to make sure that we are being intentional um, in any decision that we make or any action that we take. And um, having that open and transparent dialogue all along the way so that um, we're also making sure that as we're moving, we're adjusting. And if we do something like, for instance, in our case, we're trying to move fast for this year's graduating class of seniors, there's certain things we can't do but that we're not omitting them in the long term, that we're acknowledging we're putting them in a parking lot because they're really essential. Um, and one of those things is our youth voice, that we we aren't convening the youth um, this year in the way that we want to, but we're not omitting it in the long term because that's essential um, to make sure that we're focused on, on racial equity. Anybody else? Joanne, Nick, you want to share mm -hmm. something? Go ahead, Joanne. I was just going to say the intentionality of bringing in all the different groups of people and having them all sit at the table was really important to us and not to come with a preconceived plan on how we wanted to move forward with the jobs and workforce group. So we had people who didn't have a job who came to the meetings. We had people who helped people find jobs. We had um, nonprofit agencies, and we also had elected officials at the table who all came to the table to help us develop this plan and who are being intentional with us to work through the uh, through the work that we've been doing, at, you know, as the next step with our upward mobility project. Uh, Neela, I'll just add uh, for 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 us and for for me uh, personally, uh, it, it was just a great experience uh, to 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 meet every couple weeks with the same group, and I think a lot of times. Uh, in business, certainly, business can be a lonely game when you're the business owner and you're an entrepreneur. But in the business of doing good work, right, which we we are in, in in all of all of our organizations, we often feel like we're siloed 
and we feel like we're taking on the world's problems and we're by ourselves. And so being part of this cohort allowed us to share best practices, to share grievances, and to also um, uh, work together over an extended period of time to solve each other's problems. And so we found that I would often help other individuals in our group with their issues, with their organizations. They would help with my issues in my organization. And collectively, we were trying to address the goals and the missions that we put forth together through the cohort program. So it turned into this support group. Um, and we were just able to get a lot done in a short period of time because of that. Absolutely. Thank you, Nick. Again, you know, community capacity seems to have been. Um, one of the forefronts of bringing all of the stakeholders uh, to work within a cohort. So again, just, just stressing in the importance of creating a robust ecosystem for doing some of this groundbreaking work around racial equity. Thank you all so much. And with that, uh, I do have a few questions that have come in through the chat. And the first question is for you, Lori, do you work uh, do you work with work-based learning coordinators in school districts slash high schools? So um, as, as I alluded to, we're in the pilot year, or the pilot of the pilot. So the, the first year, and, and yes, in the particular high school that we are partnered with, um, primarily we're working with the school counselors, but as we move forward, we intend to work with their um, CTE um, coordinator, specialist, teacher. Um, and it really depends on, it'll depend on the school who and what pathway. Um, and that's what we're finding. And then um, in some some instances in um, in another high school that we've just started to, to um, start to partner with, it's um, one of our, our partners from Big Brothers, Big Sisters that is partnering in the school. And so we're sort of, you know, it's like um, you piggyback off of somebody else's initiative and then you're able to help fill in gaps of, of where they might need some capacity. Um, and so it's, um, I would say it's like, it's like a game of Jenga, figuring out like who belongs in what spot and where are their resources? Um, and then um, where are their gaps? Um, and uh, I have to say, I, I need to reiterate because we're working with, in our case, high school students, um, educators work tirelessly, but they can't do it by themselves. And what's been really um, hopeful in this is that everyone that we talk to is wanting to say, how can I, how can I be involved? What can I do? Um, you know, from the grassroots all the way to um, decision makers and, you know, purse string holders. So um, that's been refreshing. And to me, what's been um, more glaring is that cross-sector collaboration that's needed to shift to move the needle. We see that here in St. Louis from Nick's presentation, from Joanne's presentation, it took all kinds of sectors to actually pull together their expertise to, to really move the needle in, in, in ways uh, that are necessary for our communities um, to advance economic uh, mobility. So with that, um, I think we do we are coming to the end of our session. I just wanted to address a few questions that came into ROC around evaluations. We will be doing formal evaluations of our um, program this spring and summer, and hopefully we will be able to um, share results by um, 2024. With that, uh, Jenny, uh, please um, uh, close us off. And thank you again for everyone for joining us today and uh, being a part of this robust conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Nilu, and thanks to our speaker for our speakers for providing such insightful information and engaging the audience. And we wanna thank you attendees for spending your valuable time with us today. But before we end the session, we do have a few small requests. Um, you will receive a survey um, immediately after the event so we can approve, improve and continue to bring you timely and relevant topics. Um, today's session will be available on YouTube and the Connecting Communities website in about two weeks. Um, also, we encourage you to visit Fed Communities at fedcommunities.org. Uh, you can access a number of resources about community, 
community development across the Federal Reserve. And please don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter by clicking the About Us tab and then click subscribe. Follow us on social media. We're on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And finally, mark your calendars for our next Connecting Communities event on April 13th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Registration is now open and you can visit Fed Communities to register. Thanks again for joining Connecting Communities with real people for real conversations about real topics and research. Thank you.